Before I begin this sermon, I want you to think of the image of the Earth from space and realize that until 1968, none of us had ever seen it and what that meant in changing us. I was never interested in vampires. If you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said, are you kidding? I'd heard, you know, I'd probably read one vampire novel, not the 270 I have now read. Um, I had seen one movie, The Hunger, probably because I knew the author. But on my way to a conference in Florida, I bought some trashy novels for the plane, and so I read the first Twilight novel and the second Twilight novel, and it might have ended right there. But eight days later, my husband was diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer. I started obsessing on vampire novels sitting by his bedside while he slept because I was thinking about mortality. My husband and partner of 33 years was dying and he was someone who wanted to live forever. There was a definite tension between our views on death, a tension that I didn't really understand until after he died. I realize now that it's a tension that also exists in many of the most interesting vampire novels. My husband had what I would call the high-tech view of death. It was to be avoided at all costs. He was a runner. He was in perfect health. He took various supplements and antioxidants. He drank a glass of wine for resveratrol. He never smoked. He was fit. And unlike me, he never did any drugs in his youth. <laughs> he, thought, he thought he would live to be 100, preferably older, and a science journalist, he followed all the discoveries and advances of aging, research, and he thought about the stuff, and, and, and he thought when he did finally die, he might have his ashes flown up in space. His attitude was definitely rage, rage, rage against the dying of the light. At the same moment, I had more of an earth-centered pagan perspective. We're all part of the life cycle, like a seed. We are born, we sprout, we grow, we mature, we decay, making room for future generations who, like seedlings, are reborn through us. And as for the persistence of consciousness, deep down I thought, how can we know? Perhaps we simply return to the elements. We become earth and air and fire and water. In fact, I remember reading a book by the feminist author Barbara Walker in which she said that the ancient meaning of the four elements was the way we went to die. We were left for carrion in the air, we were buried in the earth, we were burned on the pyre, and we were buried in the depths of the sea. And that, that also seemed right. Although there was a part of me, way deep down, that wanted that was on my husband's wavelength and wanted to live forever. The vampire of myth and lit literature embodies some of that same tension that my husband and I had regarding death. They have near immortality and yet are tragically frozen in time. They cannot grow and change like the seasons or in most descriptions birth new light, life. And yet they have superpowers and strength and often the wisdom that can come with extreme age and often cynical and jaundiced view of life. Rosalie, who bemoans her frozen state in the Twilight novels, is asking the same questions asked in books like Tuck Everlasting and Olaf Stapleton's famous science fiction novel from the 1930 Last and First Men. Humans want to be part of nature, and yet we still want to push the edge of the envelope, seeking to be more. Vampires let us play with death and the issue of mortality. They let us ponder what it would mean to be truly long-lived. They allow us to ask questions we usually bury except in science fiction. What does one value more and what does one value less with a short human life? Is the vampire's frozen life sterile? Does life only mean something when it's part of a cycle of birth and growth and decay and death and the birth of new life? Is there a beauty that comes only from the cycles of the seasons which we are a part? So in the beginning, I pondered mortality but I knew it didn't explain the millions of readers and movie viewers and television watchers who were devouring vampire stories. An article in The Hollywood Reporter a while back said vampires brought in $7 billion to Hollywood in the last two years, the GDP of a small nation. 
130 million Twilight books have been sold the last time I looked, and this is not just a teen phenomenon. A couple of years ago when I was looking into it, there were 30,000 adult women on a Twilight Moms website. <laughs> New vampire novels continue to be bestsellers for adults and teens, and on television, there are the Vampire Diaries, True Blood, both the American and British versions of Being Human. On a recent trip to Europe, I found that my Dutch teenage relatives in Amsterdam and the 20-year-olds at the conference I was at in Edinburgh were absolutely obsessed with the Vampire Diaries. I wanted to understand why vampires have such pull, such popularity, such traction in our culture, both in America and much of Europe, at this very moment in time. Now, it's very easy to dismiss all this and to say, oh, it's all about teens and sex, or even repressed sex. You've read the articles how Twilight is all about abstinence from a Mormon point of view, and Edward's a stalker. I don't believe it for a minute. We all now know that rape is not about sex. It's about power. I began to wonder if maybe the interest in vampires was really a meditation on power and its abuses. One of the reasons that vampires are interesting is that they, like we, are in conflict over issues of power. We want it, we distrust it, we get twisted by it, we abuse it, we love it, we hate it, and we struggle with it. Almost every recent vampire novel, film, and television show confronts this issue. Amy Smith, a Quaker who teaches courses on the literature of war and also on vampire films and fiction at the University of the Pacific, puts it this way. The central question in so many of these films and novels is, if you had power over others, how would you use it? The tension is always between, we are at the top of the food chain. We can do what we want. Humans are cattle, they're prey, versus we were once human. How can we treat humans like cattle? This is the same tension, she says, we have in life. If you earn more money than someone, if you have more power than someone, how will you use it? Does having more power or status give you the right to use it? Does might make right? It's really the same question. Teens who naturally feel invisible and powerless, since they are still under the thumb of the twin authorities of school and parents, find the fantasy of difference, of special powers and abilities intoxicating. Whether these powerful creatures are the X-Men, the beings of Pandora, or vampires, they identify with the struggle of wanting power, yet they often see its dangers with clearer eyes than their parents because they are watching from outside as the older generation abuses power, often wielding it over them, often seeing their rites of passage as criminal. In an extraordinary email I received from Anne Rice, an author who has sold millions of vampire novels. She said, the vampire, the symbol for the outsider in all of us, is romanticized by teens because they so desperately need to find a noble path through the hideous passage that Western culture has set up for them. As I thought about that passage, I thought about the horrors of consumer culture they must navigate. I thought about high school. Think about the Cullens in Twilight doing high school over and over. Think about having to do your senior prom five times. Now, that's a horror story. And if we look at Buffy, the vampire slayer, it's all about power. Women, power, and leadership. In the last season of Buffy, she's forced to renounce patriarchal power and give up her own power for the power of all women. There are hundreds of scholarly articles on this. And of course, if we look further back, Voltaire, Engels, Marx, and now the people of Occupy Wall Street have all used the word vampire to describe issues of power, usually using the word for the powerful, the corrupt, the capitalist, the Wall Street trader. But that still doesn't explain what's really going on now. Every age embraces the vampire it needs, writes feminist author Nina Auerbach. Our Vampires Ourselves is her book. Every age uses vampires to express their fears and concerns, writes Eric Newsom in his book, The Dead Travel Fast. In 1897, when Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, England had the largest ports in the world. There was fear of incoming disease, of foreigners, of immigration, and Stoker cre created the perfect monster, Eastern European, bringing dirt from a foreign land. 
you can do this for every period that has had a wave of interest in vampires. In the 80s with AIDS, vampires were often described in novels as parasites. You became infected by vampirism like a disease. And the first vampire story in the English language was started in 1816 in that same chalet on the same weekend that Mary Shelley started to write Frankenstein. The fear at that time was science replacing God. So what's happening now? Who are the vampires we have created? And what are the fears and concerns they are expressing? Look at our modern vampires, most of those of the last 15, 20 years. The Cullens in Twilight, Bill Compton and Eric Northman in True Blood, Mick St. John in the CBS series Moonlight, which only had one season and was wonderful, Mitchell and Aiden, the vampire in the BBC and the uh, American series Being Human, Henry Fitzroy in Blood Ties by Tanya Hath, Stefan and Damon in the Vampire Diaries, and let's not forget Angel and Spike in Buffy. They all have something in common that makes them different from most of the vampires that went before. When I put their names in a line on a piece of paper, a light bulb went off. Unlike the vampires that went before, they're all struggling desperately to be moral, despite being predators, sometimes failing, often failing, sometimes succeeding, but always conflicted always engaged in a profound struggle to lead a moral life despite their need for blood. There's a wonderful scene in the presidential thriller Blood Oath by Christopher Farnworth, which came out a couple of years ago. It's not a very good book. The idea is that President Andrew Johnson found a vampire on a ship and imprisoned him. He managed to get Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen of New Orleans, to bind him in a blood oath to serve every president of the United States. <laughs> Nathaniel Cade, the vampire, is now in the modern world where he serves a president somewhat like Obama. In one scene, he stands in the back of an AA meeting. He does this pretty regularly because he sees himself as an addict. And while he only drinks animal blood, he still lusts for the blood of humans. We humans are addicts, not only in the obvious ways, you know, abusing alcohol and cigarettes and drugs and food. We're clearly in a struggle with an addictive lifestyle. Our jobs, the economy, the way we live and commute, the way our infrastructure is set up, all compromise us. We depend, at least for now, on continuing an addictive relationship with fossil fuels. Oil is our blood, and our addiction compromises the earth. Vampires are exactly us right now, as we wage wars, use oil, and suck the lifeblood out of the planet. Whitley Strieber, author of The Hunger, goes further. He says, our prey is the planet. If so, vampires are us, and the issue before us is how we can learn to use our formidable powers without destroying the world and future generations. Like vampires, we are in a struggle with our own predation. You may ask, when did we create this vampire that represents our moral struggle? At first, I thought it started with Buffy, and then I thought it went back to Anne Rice, and then I thought, wow, it really goes back 45 years to Dark Shadows and the vampire Barnabas. Dark Shadows started in 66, but Barnabas didn't appear until well into 67, and the word vampire was never used until 68. In 1966, Stuart Brand, the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog and one of the most significant environmental journals that he wrote, you know, took an LSD trip. He took an LSD trip on the rooftop in San Francisco, and he was meditating on something that Buckminster Fuller, the futurist, once said, that the root of man's misbehavior was the notion that the earth was flat and infinite. On LSD, he suddenly felt and saw the curve of the earth. When he came down, he printed up a political button and sent a couple hundred all over the world. He sent them to NASA and Soviet US officials and to members of the United Nations and members of Congress. The button had this sentence, why have we not yet seen a picture of the whole Earth? While there were a couple of fuzzy views from satellites, it would take Apollo 8 in 1968 to give us that color picture of the Earth rising. And four years later, Apollo 17 gave us the picture of the blue marble earth, which may, may well be the most reproduced picture in history. 
Those photographs changed us. At first, we saw the earth as having no boundaries. We're all brothers and sisters, we thought. But eventually, we understood a darker vision. We saw our vulnerabilities for the first time. We saw ourselves as compromised, morally standing on this fragile planet and not doing what we needed to do to save her. 1970 was the first Earth Day, the real beginning of the environmental movement. We suddenly saw the Earth's fragility, a tiny ball of brilliant color in a dark universe, a ball so small the astronauts could blot it out with their thumb. They all noted it, and we all changed. This image changed us in our thinking. Our vampires changed at the same moment. I think the vampires so many are identifying with allow us to look at ourselves more clearly, to see the compromises we make daily, the moral struggles we often lose or more commonly deny. Sylvia Plath wrote, I'm terrified of this dark thing that lives in me. And Stephen Moore in The Vampire in Verse writes, the reason you can't see a vampire in the mirror the vampire is a mirror reflecting our secret self. Hopefully these morally conflicted vampires will allow us not only to see our abuses of power more clearly, but give us a few insights on how we can struggle to live more morally on the earth. And now when someone says to me, how could you waste three years reading 270 vampire novels? I paraphrase something that was written by Victoria Nelson, who wrote a book called Gothica. And she was paraphrasing Philip K. Dick, the great science fiction writer. That when the divine is exiled from much of our culture, sometimes you have to find it in the trash. <laughs> Blessed be. <laughs>